Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I originally studied in South Africa, and it was always my dream to come to England. Um, in those days, everybody wanted to get a PhD, wanted to come and study in, somewhere in England, and eventually I was a postdoc over here, and um, I studied in the United States, and I was a postdoc over here, um, and um, I'm happy to be back again now. So um, I, I'm going to launch into my talk. It is a little bit about what um, I was introduced as about the precarious state of models in finance. And my, the book that I wrote um, was called Models Behaving Badly, the periods between the models and behaving and badly, because there were actually three subse subsections to the book. The first part was about models. The second part about, was about models behaving. And the third part was about models behaving badly. Um, so it wasn't all about models behaving badly. So I'm going to start by trying to give a summary of, um, of where I'm trying to go. And it's a bit of an epistemological talk about theories, models, and intuition. And I thought I'd just have a summary slide first. So um, yeah, I'll put that over there. Models, models behaving, and models behaving badly. And this is sort of a summary of what I want to try to um, get across from my point of view. Um, so theories, I'm going to argue that theories are ways of describing the world, and they stand on their own feet and don't rely on analogies. Um, models, I'm going to argue, stand on somebody else's feet. They're metaphors that explain the world we don't understand in terms of worlds that we think we understand better. Um, models tell you what something is more or less like, whereas theories try to tell you what something is. It sounds like I'm putting down models, and I'm not. I'm, I'm going to explain this, but, but the application of models is often much less successful, especially in finance than in theories. Um, and then one of the points I want to make, and which I try to make in my book, um, is that the equations of physics and the equations of finance really do resemble each other very closely, speci especially classical, classical physics. They resemble each other very closely from an equational point of view syntactically, but that their semantics is actually very different, um, which I think people get confused at when they first come into the field, um, physicists who, who, who make the transition. And um, I want to argue that financial models are actually almost never theories, um, unlike in physics, which has both models and theories. And um, they're always analogies. They're always idealizations um, that sweep dirt under the rug. And um, good models and good modelers really have an obligation to explain to the people that use them and to the world in general what the dirt is and, and where it will be found and, and um, when you might run into it. So that's a short precy of what I want to talk about. And um, um, I will launch into it. I'm, I'm happy to take questions along the way if I say something that isn't clear um, or at the end. So I want to talk a little bit about ways of knowing um, in terms of trying to understand the inanimate world and the, and the animate world. And um, how, how do you approach understanding the world? I know a lot of people here are physicists. I've, I, I don't normally talk to physicists, so I'm going to actually maybe tell you stuff you know, but, but um, I need to do it in order to, to describe the way I like to think about things. So um, I'm going to talk about what everybody in elementary physics learns, or maybe in this country even learns in high school, um, the great triumph at the dawn of modern science, the understanding of gravitation and motion. And um, as everybody knows, especially in this audience, for millennia after the Greeks, um, scientists and everybody else described the planetary movements in terms of circles about a stationary Earth. And when that didn't work very well, they had epicycles, which in a sense are a kind of Fourier analysis of circles within circles within circles. And, um, and that was the way they liked to think about things. Um, but as everybody also knows, the, the word planet comes from the Latin planeo for wanderer, for, for to wander. And um, as seen from the orbiting Earth itself, if you look at planets moving in the sky, they do retrograde motion. They don't move smoothly against the fixed stars. They go forward and come back for a while, depending on where they are relative to the Earth. And so you need more than one circle to describe their motion, unlike um, the stars that, that seem to rotate about the Earth. Um, eventually, Galileo pointed out that the Earth wasn't stationary and that the Earth and planets actually orbited the Sun um, and that all these weird retrograde motions were actually one's mind boggles at how he figured it out, actually, um, that they were not intrinsically theirs, but, but um, rather a consequence of being observed from a moving rather than a stationary platform. And so when the Earth speeded up relative to one of the planets, they seemed to go backwards when they were, when they were um, both on the same side of the sun. Um, after Galileo um, came Kepler, and um, Kepler... Kepler, it's hard to understand how he did this without computers, but Kepler was able to take the, the Tycho Brahe observations of the, of the planets and, um, 
and formulate his three laws of planetary motion, which he had to unfold out um, the motion of the Earth so that he could figure out how these planets moved relative to the sun. And he came up with these three rather astonishing laws of planetary motion. The first one is that planets move in ellipses about the sun, um, with the sun at one of the foci. Um, secondly, and to me even more astonishing, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, um, the line between the sun and a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times, which ends up being equivalent to the law of conservation of angular momentum. And, um, and so, sorry, the, the, the second law tells you the relation between the speed of a planet when it's close to the sun and when it's far from the sun for a single planet. And then the third law tells you the relation between the orbits of different planets and says that the square of the orbital period, the time taken to travel around the sun, is proportional to the cube of the radius, so it relates different planetary orbits to each other. The second one relates motion within the same, within the same planetary orbit. Um, Kepler's second law to me is kind of astonishing because um, here's, a, here's a diagram of, of, um, um, of a schematic diagram of the sun at one of the foci of the ellipse. And you see when the sun, those two green tri triangles or arcs are meant, to, um, are meant to have equal area approximately. And you can see that when you're far away, you have to move more slowly to sweep out the same area compared to when you're close on the left, you have to move faster in the same unit time to sweep out the same area. And um, if you look at how Kepler phrases this, he says the line between the sun and the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And um, as I said later on, that becomes equivalent to Newton's law or, or follows from Newton's laws and the law of conservation of angular momentum. Um, but um, yeah, I said this, the, the closer the planet is to the sun, the more rapidly it moves. The astonishing thing for me is that there actually is no line between the planet and the sun. And so how does Kepler get to formulate, if he looks at the data, how does he get to say, I'm going to describe the motion of the planet um, in terms of a line that is actually invisible and doesn't exist between the planet and the sun at all? Um, there was no line, therefore Kepler to observe, he really only had planetary positions in the, in the sky. Um, I don't know how he did this. There's a, there's, a, there's a very interesting book by Arthur Kistler, about 50 years old, whose title I suddenly forget, but all about the, going from the Greek discoveries all the way through to how Kepler came up successively with the three laws. And then Newton, um, the title suddenly slips me. Maybe somebody remembers it. Um, OK. Um, anyway, nobody knows exactly. But if you read his book, you see it involved long immersion in data, Lots of struggle, lots of associative thinking, and then, aha, at the end, some intuition followed by checking the data. First, for the fact that these orbits are, are actually ellipses and not circles. And secondly, that he gets equal, equal areas swept out in equal times. Kepler's laws are only really description of planets. And actually, if you come from a financial background, you should be kind of surprised because he says the square of the, planet, the, square of the, of the, of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the, of, the, um, of the radius, he doesn't say the square is 2.1 plus or minus 0.3 and the cube is 3.05 plus or minus 0.15. So he says this very, very, um, very dogmatically. Um, it's, not, it's not data science. Um, and, and they're only descriptions of patterns. So although one calls them laws, they're not laws in the same sense that Newton then comes along with his laws. Um, Kepler described planets, described the pattern um, of the planets, but he doesn't actually say anything about their causes. He's just describing, um, um, describing the, the, the arc that they, that they, the relation between, between different things, but not what causes them. And what's, Newton then comes along and actually finds the cause. He shows that Kepler's laws were a mathematical consequence of Newton's own theories, and in fact, Newton's embraced immediately because he's able to explain Kepler's laws from, from, um, from much more fundamental statements. So um, again, I'm going to get beyond telling you things you know, but I want to go through them. So first of all, he writes down the theory of gravitation in the mid-1600s, the inverse square law of attraction, which says that any two masses attract each other um, proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the radius squared. And so that tells him the force between the planets, the planet and the sun, the, the earth and an apple, etc., the earth and the moon. And then he writes down how you calculate the motion from the force. And he says force equals mass times acceleration. So two laws, which I shortly want to call theories. Um, and so, so different from, from Kepler's, Kepler's laws, laws they, they laws, laws of causality, causality or statements, statements of causality, causality rather than statements about patterns. 
Um, how did Newton discover his theories? Again, I, I want to argue against data science. The orbiting planets and the falling apples don't stand there and announce F equals MA or G equals M1, M2 over R squared or even um, the, the equation for an ellipse or equal areas in equal times. It's sort of astonishing that somebody can look at the world and come up with a, sta come up with a description of a statement like that. I'm going to say later that this doesn't really happen in finance. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so Newton does this by some kind of intuition. And I want to talk about four modes of understanding. And the first one, um, which nobody really understands that well, is intuition. And I think it takes intuition to attempt to discover and to actually discover the nature of the world, be it animate or inanimate. Um, if you look at Kepler or Newton or Ampere or Maxwell or Einstein or Dirac, many of whose um, pictures I saw in the, in, the, in the entrance hall over here with descriptions of what they achieved, um, um, they all actually, if you read the history, they all recursively refer to each other as making these discoveries that nobody can understand. I want to quote a few of them. Um, and by intuition, I don't mean, I sort of don't mean something casual, but if you read about how they did this, um, it takes intimate knowledge and long struggle and, and lots of mathematical work and data analysis um, acquired by careful observation and painstaking effort. It's not just a flash in the pan, it's a flash in the pan after a lot of struggle and, and, um, and a rare flash in the pan, but nevertheless, um, some intuitive insight that isn't there in the data. Um, the famous Keynes, who's, um, who's, uh, who's all in the news for the last four or five years over here as well as in the United States, and with all the quantitative easing, um, there's a talk that he gave in, he actually wrote it in 16, excuse me, in 1942, um, John Maynard Keynes, um, on the tercentenary of Newton's birth, and um, then didn't actually deliver it until 1945 because of the war in Cambridge, at which point he was actually dead, but his brother delivered the talk. And, um, and it's very interesting. You can find it. Um, I actually quoted it in my book, but I had to pay somebody in the Keynes estate $500 in order to quote it. But actually, you can find it anywhere you like on the internet for free, but you can't actually put it in a book without paying for it. Um, but there are thousands of copies. I always think there's a job opportunity here, a business opportunity for somebody to intermediate people who want to, um, who want to quote somebody and people who want to be paid but don't really want to go to the trouble of being paid. I tried to quote Philip Larkin at some point, and they didn't want to take my money, honestly. Um, um, it was too much trouble for them. So, and, and publishers won't let you quote more than two lines without, without written permission. So... Um, I recommend looking up this article if you just Google Keynes on Newton. So this is what he wrote. He wrote, this is a short quote he wrote about Newton. I fancy his preeminence is due to his muscles of intuition being the strongest and most enduring with which a man has ever been gifted. I believe that the clue to his mind is to be found in his unusual powers of continuous, concentrated introspection. His peculiar gift was the power of holding continuously in his mind a purely mental problem until he had seen straight through it. And Keynes actually found a lot of a box of Newton's old papers somewhere in a college in, in, in Cambridge that nobody had read before. And somewhere in the rest of the speech, he says Keynes actually wasn't the last, the first of the rationalists. He was the last of the great magicians. Sorry, he says Newton was the last of the great magicians and gives lots of examples and quotes some um, De Morgan saying um, that Occasionally, when, when somebody asked Newton how he knew something, he sort of said, I know it, but if you give me a couple of days, I'll prove it. Um, so very, very interesting speech that Keynes gave. And um, so that's one thing about intuition. The second thing is, um, just to give a couple of examples, is Maxwell on Ampere. If you, if, um, for those of you who remember or don't, just as Newton, Newton and Coulomb wrote down the inverse square law of attraction between two charges or two particles, Ampere wrote down the law of force between two current elements, um, which is more complicated because they're vectorial and you have to write down the, the direction that the current elements are pointing in and the, and the angle that it makes with the line between them. And Ampere wrote down the law and he entitled his paper a derivation of the law of force between current elements based on experiment. And um, Maxwell and Poincaré later point out that it can't be based on experiment because nobody can get two isolated current elements. They're always part of a circuit. And so his, his description of how he got it isn't, isn't, um, isn't totally honest or, or not that he's trying to mislead people. But Maxwell actually says, we can scarcely believe that Ampere really discovered the law of action by means of the experiments which he describes. We are led to suspect what indeed he tells us himself, that he discovered the law by some process which he has not shown us. 
and that when he had afterwards built up a perfect demonstration, he removed all traces of the scaffolding which he had, which had built, which he had used to build it. So um, again, what I'm trying to accentuate is some kind of um, insight or intuition that these people can't really describe and um, is not coming from the data itself. Um, Maxwell calls Ampere the Newton of electricity and later on other people make similar remarks, Einstein, about Maxwell's discovery of the extra term that he adds to Maxwell's equations that lead to um, deciding, discovering that light and light waves are really just electromagnetic waves. So I, I want to sort of say that intuition sort of a little bit metaphorically is when the observer becomes so close to the, either the object or the person that he's observing that he or she begins to experience their existence almost in a quantum mechanical way from both inside and outside simultaneously. And it's a kind of a merging of the observer with the observed and um, what, what isn't obvious becomes, becomes perceived in some way. Um, now I want to talk about theories like Maxwell's and like Newton's um, that I think get their inspiration from some kind of intuition. Um, I couldn't make this pop up later, but um, so it's there before because it's an image, but you can see Maxwell's equations and the Dirac equation, um, but I'm going to get to them. So I want to argue that after intuition, theories are really deep descriptions of the laws of the world or, some, or, or sometimes not correct and just an attempt to make deep descriptions of the laws of the world. Um, and I want to explain why, but I, I want to argue that theories are a qualitative way of understanding things in the sense that they can be right, they could be partially right, or a theory could actually be wrong, but it can still be a theory and not be a model, which I'm going to get to shortly. Um, so I, I like to argue this because occasionally people will say to me that Newton's laws aren't quite correct and special relativity or quantum mechanics supersedes them and therefore they're only a model, but I, I want to, for various reasons, which I'll get to shortly, argue that they're still a theory, they're just not 100% right. But in, in, um, in essence, they're a theory. Oh, sorry, wrong button. Okay, so um, if I can give an example, um, when I was small, I, I, read a lot of, I read a lot of the Bible and um, there's a story about Moses um, in the desert uh, when God tells Moses um, to, to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let his people go and Moses, somewhat like Jonah, who's told to, um, to go and tell the people of Nineveh to stop, to stop sinning, um, they both run away from their obligation and Moses, Jonah gets swallowed by a whale and Moses actually goes into the desert and um, tends his father-in-law's sheep and doesn't really want to do what he's supposed to do. And at some point when he's wandering in the desert, um, he comes across a burning bush which keeps burning but he's never actually consumed. And you sort of understand that God is inside the bush and the voice says to him, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let your people go. And Moses says, um, who shall, he's playing for time really, and he says, who shall I say sent me? Um, since he doesn't really want to go. And, um, and the voice comes out and says to him, um, tell them I am what I am. And um, what God is saying, actually in Hebrew, it's, it's eh, yeah, shere, eh, it means I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. And the root of the word I am in Hebrew is actually the same as the root of the word Jehovah. So he's kind of making a bit of a pun on his name. And it's the root of the word being. But he's saying, I am what I am. And in a sense, I think what he's saying is, you can't compare me to anything else. You can't make graven images of me because there's nothing you can compare me to. I am simply, I am simply what I am. It's a little bit like Popeye as well. Um, but but, um, but um, he's saying you can't compare me to other things that you know about. And I think that's kind of, for me, the, the, the quality of theories in that theories are an absolute form of knowledge, not a relative form of knowledge, or, or an absolute form of attempted knowledge, not a relative form. Theories say this is the way the world behaves or this is the way I think the way the world behaves without referencing some analogy to something else. So um, I would argue that, yes, I know Newton's laws have been supplanted by Einstein's in the sense that they're more accurate, but to me, Newton is still a theory. He's not an, I understand the results are, Einstein ends up giving the results to which Newton is just an approximation or an approximation to Einstein is, is Newton's, um, is Newton's um, gravitational force, but I would argue they're still both theories. Um, um, 
if I can make an analogy, if, if, um, if I can do handwriting and write with a, with a fountain pen and write cursive, or if I can do typing, they're both ways of transmitting information, but they're independent ways. The one isn't an approximation to the other. Typing isn't an approximation to handwriting. Handwriting isn't an approximation to typing. One might be more accurate, but they're different ways. Similarly, um, navigating by the stars or navigating via global positioning satellite or independent ways of navigation. But the one isn't an approximation to the other. The one may be more accurate than the other. So I want to argue both of those are still theories. Um, I said this here, two different approaches reach the same end by different means with different accuracies, but both still have, are both still an absolute attempt to describe the facts. I wrote down here Maxwell's theory for light, which describes everything I'm using right now, together with, with the Dirac equation. And um, Maxwell also added this, this extra term for the displacement current, which wasn't there before, and he somehow came up with by pulling it out of his head or out of the vacuum. Um, um, the Dirac equation describes electrons in quantum electrodynamics. Um, together, these describe all the laser pointers and, and quantum optics, more or less, with quantum mechanics. Um, I think these are. I think these are absolute descriptions rather than relative descriptions. If you look at Maxwell, he actually started out trying to describe light by comparing it to hydrodynamics, and he actually says he's building a model because he doesn't understand things well enough to create a theory. And then when he writes his subsequent paper, and he says he's sort of doing a warm-up exercise, then when he writes his final paper on, he calls it a theory of electromagnetic phenomena, and he eventually writes down these equations, and theory in the sense being absolute, not a comparison with, with water flow. Um, similarly, the Dirac equation, which I don't really have time to go into a lot, but it starts out with an attempt to um, unify, um, unify quantum mechanics and special relativity, and becomes metaphorical for a while with the description of the Dirac C, but, um, but ends up really being an absolute description of the electron. And I'm not sure, but from my experience in physics, I would argue that most physicists who look at light um, don't think Maxwell's equations are a model for light, but think Maxwell's equations are the mental or, or, or verbal or symbolic description of the behavior of light with quantum mechanics, that the two are sides of the same coin rather than one of them being an approximate model of what happens. I think it must be very, my perception of having been in physics a long time ago, but for a long time, is that one equates Maxwell's equations with light. One doesn't think of Maxwell's equations as being a model for light, but thinks that there's some, feels there's some identity. Similarly with the, with the Dirac equation in quantum electrodynamics. Um, there's a line by Goethe in one of his books where he says, one day we will realize that every fact is really a theory. And it sounds a little, um, a little obtuse, but I think what he's saying is, is that to my understanding that um, if you take, for example, Maxwell's equation that light is the fact and the obvious side of the coin is that the equations are the theory and, and what he means by it being a fact is that if you know that light satisfies Maxwell's equations, you can't ask why. That's just the bottom of the chain. You can't recurse any further. Or if you know the electron satisfies um, the Dirac equation, you can't ask why because that's just a fact. Maybe, maybe it'll come from a deeper theory, but that will be a fact. Um, okay, I want to move on. Oh, I, I gave a lot of examples which are all um, mathematical. So I want to give an example of something that's a theory which is not mathematical and, and more easily accessible to people who don't come from a physics background. So there's a famous book by Spinoza written also around the time of Newton a little bit earlier um, called um, The Ethics, which is all about um, people's misery in life and how to overcome it. And he starts out by discussing people's emotions or the passions, as he, call them, that, as he calls them, that sweep everybody in their power and ends up talking about how to liberate oneself from them. But to start with, he does a sort of phenomenological analysis of what he calls the passions. And um, he does this actually avowedly by trying to adopt a scientific approach. And he actually says he wants to treat people's behavior um, or people's emotions the way Euclid treats geometry. And he actually says that in words. Um, it was only published posthumously. And so um, in the same way as Euclid starts out with points and lines and planes, and everybody intuitively knows what a point and a line and a plane is from having lived, but nevertheless, Euton, um, Euclid defines them in a fairly abstract sort of way. Um, Spinoza says he's going to do the same thing for emotions. So he starts out with three primitives too, which are desire, and I've got them in colors for various reasons in the diagram coming up. He starts out with desire and pleasure and pain, and he actually defines 
desire and pleasure and pain very, very abstractly, but you wouldn't know what they were if you didn't actually know what their meaning was, like points, lines, and planes from, from everyday life and experience. And then he starts to build up what I would call a theory of how all the other emotions or passions, um, his, his ultimate aim is going to be how to overcome them. Um, but he first wants to describe them, and so he relates them all to desire, pleasure, and pain. So rather utilitarianly, he says, good is everything that brings pleasure, and evil is everything that brings pain. And then he says, love is pleasure associated with an external object. This is sort of a very modern derivative theory in the sense he's saying, just like an option is related to its underlying stock, um, love is simply related to, um, at, the bot at bottom, to pleasure. And rather obviously hate, pain, hate is pain associated with an external object. And then he says, gets a little bit more sophisticated, he says envy is pain at somebody else's pleasure. So for those of you who come from a financial background, this is a bit like a convertible bond in the sense that it's got an equity and a, and a, and a fixed income underlier. And he's actually very clever. This is written more than 400, uh, 350 years ago. He says um, there are going to be all kinds of emotions that he can define, some of which actually don't have names. And he presumably doesn't know about schadenfreude, which is actually pleasure at somebody else's pain. And so he actually, he's actually open to all of this. Um, and then he says, hope is expectation of future pleasure tinged with doubt. Um, fear is expectation of future pain. And he says, cruelty is what you call somebody's desire to inflict pain on someone that you love. Um, that's like a convertible bond with credit risk as well as the underlier. Um, so it, it actually is really a derivative theory and very modern. He's actually got, I want to make sure I have enough time. He's actually got three more primitives in there. Desire and pleasure and pain lie at the bottom. And then he has three more things which are vacillation and wonder and contempt. And they're not, um, they're not at the bottom substrate the way pleasure, pain, and desire are. They're more like vacillation is the oscillation between two different emotions. So for example, he says jealousy is an oscillation between, I'm not sure if I remember this actually, but an oscillation between love and envy. And, um, and wonder is sort of what Moses experiences at the, at the burning bush. Wonder is what you experience when you're confronted by something that doesn't fit any of your categories. And um, contempt or scorn, he has scorn separately, is what you feel when you're confronted by something whose um, who's, who's, um, who's most pertinent features are the absence of what it has rather than the qualities that it has. Um, I made a diagram, which I kind of like, um, um, which I put in my book, but they wouldn't let me print it in color, unfortunately. Um, but, I actually, but it's actually, it's all Spinoza's definitions, but um, I put um, cruelty and pain and pleasure over there, and this is wonder and vacillation and, um, and, and contempt over there. And actually, if you look at it, it's too small to see. I have it on my website. But he actually has, almost he has melancholy, compassion, benevolence, hate, shame, derision, humility, disappointment, confidence, joy, honor, disdain self-approval, all of them ultimately go down through several levels to the three bottom ones, which are pleasure, pain, and desire. Somebody wrote me an email which, uh, which pointed out that there's actually no anxiety there. Apparently, that's either a 19th or 20th century emotion, or some people argue it's not an emotion at all. It's something different, but he never has anxiety. So uh, the reason I'm showing you all this is, A, it's kind of related, or B, it's kind of related to, to a modern theory of derivatives in finance, and A, I think it may, it, may, it may be true, it may not be true, but I think it's got the qualities of a theory in that it's an attempt to describe an emotional framework based on introspection and an absolute description of the relation between various things, not by saying the brain is like a computer or the heart is like a, a hydraulic pump or all, all sorts of things which are, which are half true but, but faulty. This may not be true, but it's, but it's, it's an attempt to find an Absolute, like Freud or, or like the theory of evolution, an attempt to find an absolute description rather than a relative one, which for me is what makes it a theory. Um, now I want to talk about models. Um, this is from Schopenhauer, just to, to have a financial metaphor. He says, sleep is the interest that we have to pay on the capital which is called in a death. And the higher the rate of interest and the more regularly it is paid, the further the date of redemption is postponed. <laughs> so a very pretty metaphor comparing sleep to, um, to paying interest on a, on a loan. But if you think about it, um, um, there's actually only one overlap between sleep and between interest on a loan, and that is the periodicity. You sleep at regular intervals, and, um, and you pay interest on a loan at regular intervals. And based on that, he's then building this quite elaborate metaphor 
based on really only a partial overlap between the two things that says since they're both periodic, um, but since in the case of the bond you once borrowed money and you have to repay it at the end, in the case of sleep you must have once borrowed your light from the void and you have to give it back at the end and your incremental sleep is simply paying, paying the interest on the darkness, so to speak. Um, so I think metaphors like that are an insight that there's a similarity between something you're interested in and something else you think you understand better. Um, I want to argue that all models from a, from a qualitative or, or um, animal, um, epistemological point of view are really metaphors in that they compare something you don't understand too well to something you think you do. Um, so I spoke about Maxwell's equations and Newton's laws and the Dirac equation, and I think those are theories being absolute descriptions. Um, there's a famous liquid drop model of the atomic nucleus, which people, several people got the Nobel Prize for about 40 or 50 years ago. And they describe the nucleus, which is 10 to the minus 12 centimeters large, but very dense, as, and really made up, say, in the case of uranium, of 238 protons and neutrons. But they describe it as a liquid drop that can vibrate and rotate and oscillate. And they calibrate it to what they know about the nucleus. And then from its excited states, from its vibrational and rotational excited states, predict the existence of higher order excited um, nuclear levels. And, um, and um, that's useful, and it's picturesque, and it works very well. But it's not true in the same sense that Maxwell's equations or Newton's laws or, um, or the Dirac equation are true. It's qualitatively an attempt to compare something that isn't like something else, but has some similarity to it, and to, and to use it and push, push that notion as far as you can. Um, so they're models in physics and their theories. And I think physicists, I think partly that's one of the advantages have um, somebody asked me earlier before I came here, one of the advantages that physicists maybe have when they come to do economics despite their lack of economic background is that they understand the difference between a model and a theory and between a good model and a bad model because they've seen them, whereas most economists have never really seen a good model, so it becomes very hard to, <laughs> to, to know when you've seen a bad one. I, I don't mean to put down economics totally. I think it's just a much more difficult field because you're dealing with social and human phenomena. So in the same way, the Black-Scholes financial option model which um, I and probably a lot of people in this room have spent a lot of time working on, it compares, by analogy, the uncertain up and down movements of stock prices or stock returns to the diffusion of smoke from a cigarette. And that's useful too, because cigarette smoke does move in a diffusive, uncertain way, and stock prices move in an uncertain way too, but they don't really diffuse. They do much more dramatic things. And so it's, it's a useful way of thinking about the possible behavior of stock prices, but Unlike the Dirac equation, it's nothing remotely like a fact. Um, it, it's, it's quite inaccurate, but nevertheless a useful way of thinking about things, much more like the liquid drop model. Um, so I said theories tell you what something is. Models merely attempt to tell you what something's more or less like. And models are really metaphors. And I think that's one of the semantic differences that people forget about. Even if financial models use the same symbols, they're really images of reality, um, but not reality itself. And um, we're all in danger of forgetting that. And if you forget that, you're, I would argue, in some sense, you're becoming an idolater and thinking that something that you wrote down out of, out of, with a pen and paper or, or out of clay, um, um, you're, you're making an image of something that's really living, like markets and people, and um, um, it's not going to be correct. And, and you suffer all the dangers of, of, of worshiping idols. Um, I want to, before I go on to finance, I want to talk a little bit about um, data and statistics because for the last couple of years you read a lot in the paper about big data and big data being a possible way of, um, of, uh, of, of getting at the truth too. Um, there was an article in Wired magazine, maybe in the British version a few years ago, by Chris Anderson saying that in the future people won't have to worry about um, theories anymore because they'll just find out everything they need to from doing regressions on data. Um, I don't think that's really true. Um, the, the statistical analysis that lies behind big data, um, statistics, I'm, I'm really saying obvious stuff here, but, but I like to repeat it because I think people forget it. Statistics is really just an attempt to find past tendencies and correlations in data that one's already collected. Um, often people like to assume that they will persist, and people aren't stupid. They often have some dynamical or causal model in the back of their heads when they write down a regression or when they, when they get the results of a regression. 
but, um, but there's no causality involved in any really quantitative or even very qualitative way. Um, and correlation doesn't really, doesn't really imply causation at all and is subject to all the mistakes of assuming that. Um, so I, I, I like to think that big data is definitely useful, especially in the advertising world, of course. Um, but it's not really a replacement for the classic ways of understanding the world, which are still, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I think data, as I said at the beginning, I don't think data really has a voice. Kepler's, Kepler's look at Tycho Brahe's data didn't announce um, I'm moving in an ellipse or, um, or I'm moving, sweeping out equal areas in equal time. There's no such thing as raw data. It's choosing what data to collect, take some insight, and deciding what way to look at it and what way to make sense of it um, still requires some classic, some, one of the classic methods which are either intuition or a model or a theory and the data is useful for that but doesn't announce, doesn't announce the truth in any way at all um, in the medical field or, or I believe in any other field but especially not in physics. Um, there's a line um, in Wittgenstein's book that says philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language which I take to mean that um, if you take language too seriously, it can deceive your natural intuition. But if you take the, the meaning of the words more literally, then, then, then maybe you should. And you need philosophy to reclaim your intuition. And um, in the same way, I want to sort of paraphrase him and say, science is a battle against the smothering of your intelligence by big data. And, um, and it takes models or theories or, or, um, or intuition often at the beginning to try to make sense out of them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about financial models since um, I, spent, I spent the whole second part of my career working on financial models and often using, using physics techniques. Um, ah, this, is, this is a little bit polemical, but, but everybody knows what this is. It's a picture of a hedge, probably somewhere in England. Um, it comes out of Wikipedia. Um, here's my polemic. Uh, a hedge is a line of closely spaced shrubs and tree species planted and trained to form a barrier or to mark the boundary of an area. Um, what J.P. Morgan with the, with the London Whale recently called a hedge is a collection of securities that aim to protect another collection of securities against changes in value. And hedge, it, it's a metaphor, what I'm really trying to say is it's a metaphorical use of the word in a different context for something that really does form a boundary to something that you hope will form a boundary, but, but you shouldn't be misled. Um, value really isn't the same as price. Um, value is always determined pretty much by a model. Different people have different models for value. Um, a financial hedge, as I just said, is a metaphor and really a very imperfect analogy. Um, although people use the word all the time, um, a security is kind of a metaphor too when you think about it. Um, it's not really that secure. Um, so I want to argue, sort of getting ahead of myself, don't be fooled by equations in finance. They, there's nothing wrong with them. They look very precise. I'm going to talk a little bit later about what's the right attitude to have to them. But they don't really describe in an accurate, factual way what they aim to describe. And you always have to be aware or um, not, not forget that. Um, so, OK, let me, let me talk about models in finance. Um, whoa. OK. Um, I said this before. I think physics really has, in a useful way, theories and models. And I think there are a few people that would disagree with me, but, but I would argue that finance Finance pretty much only has models. There's nothing there that's really a description of financial facts, except maybe you can't fool all of the people all of the time or something like that. But no mathematical statement. The Dirac equation really can write down a one-inch equation that really describes to immense accuracy um, um, the behavior of something, even if not to infinite accuracy, to 12 decimal places. Um, finance has nothing like that, um, and I believe never will. And nevertheless, the equations tend to look as though they're usable with that kind of accurate, with not even that accuracy, with even one or two decimal places. It's really not true at all. Um, people who come from physics, or sometimes it used to be people who came from finance, but never worked with markets, tend to think that the point of a model is divination, or trying to tell you what's going to happen into the future. And that really doesn't work very well in finance, as, as, um, as we've seen for the last four years. But I think if you work for a few years in markets, you sort of get to realize that. Um, and I want to try to explain, at least from my point of view, the way people seriously use models in finance. Um, so I want to give an example. Um, I, I come from New York, so um, there's probably an analogy in London. But supposing you, um, you want to buy a very fancy 12-room penthouse on, 
on Park Avenue, I don't, on a high floor, I don't know what the analogy is here, maybe somewhere, I don't know, Belgravia or, or Mayfair or somewhere. Um, and, and you don't know what to pay for it because there's been a crisis and it hasn't traded very often and so you can't really find a price. Um, and instead, all you can do is look, say, in Battery Park City where Wall Street is hiring and firing employees all the time. And so there's a high turnover and you can f see what the price of an apartment is every day or every second day. So how would you figure out the price of this fancy apartment based on the sale or price of a one bedroom or a studio apartment in Battery Park City? Um, my argument is if I were being rational, I would say, okay, let me try to replicate a 12 bedroom or 12 room apartment on Park Avenue out of more fungible liquid Battery Park City apartments. And I could say, assuming that price per square foot is a constant, which I understand it isn't, but as a first approximation, it takes me seven and a half Battery Park City apartments to replicate one big penthouse on Park Avenue. And so backing out the price per square foot for a Battery Park City apartment, I can estimate what the fair price of a, of a, of a grand apartment is. And that's a zeroth order attempt at a model. And then I can start to make higher order corrections by taking account of the number of um, staff that you have in the building, the school location, the views, et cetera, et cetera, the appliances. And then you become aware, um, uh, then you become aware that actually price per square foot, it's sort of a model. It's not really the price per square foot because there are many other things in the apartment that have value from location to appliances to school district. But if you insist on quoting everything in terms of price per square foot, then it gives you a zeroth order way to try to extrapolate to something from something liquid to something illiquid. And then you have to make higher order corrections. Um, and I think that's what most models, that, that's a corny example, but that's what most models do in finance. Um, they take something you can intuitively think about in a linear sense, like the price per square foot you pay for something, and let you transform that into the value via model of something that's, um, that you would have a harder time estimating the, the amount of dollars or pounds or euros you should pay for it. So models are really used to move from liquid fungible things to estimate the value, the value but not the price of things that don't have values or whose values you can't easily tell from, from the market because they don't trade too often. So for example, price per square foot to go to apartment price um, with bonds. Um, you can look at a lot of different bonds and they have different maturities and different issuers and different coupons and you don't know where value lies but if somebody tells you the yield to maturity of the bond that becomes something like price per square foot that tells you what value you're getting if you hold it to maturity. Similarly with options, I mean the Black-Scholes model, you can take something fairly sophisticated which was very sophisticated in 1973 but now is, is everyday knowledge as people get get more numerate and smarter, you can take an estimate of future volatility of stock prices and use that to calculate an option price by comparing the option in the Black-Scholes model to, making, to, to, cons to replicating it out of a liquid stock and a liquid bond. And you know the price of a stock, you know the price of a bond. Black-Scholes tells you via equations how to create, it gives you a recipe for creating an option out of a stock and a bond and the one unknown is the volatility. And if you have an estimate for volatility, which you can think about as you get smart and watch markets and get some experience for volatility under different circumstances, you can come up with an estimate of the option price. But it is a model. It's based on diffusion. Um, so the point I want to make about models is mostly people don't use them to predict the future. They use them to interpolate from liquid prices to illiquid ones. From It's always a relative thing rather than an absolute thing. Um, Maybe I will say this. Um, in, 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 in physics, um, if you shoot a rocket to the moon, you start now and, and um, Newton's laws or, or general relativity, if, you, if you're more careful, tells you um, how the rocket is going to move and how to make it link up with something else in space. Um, so in, in physics, you really start now and work your way into the future. In finance, you mostly don't. You're always working in the present. You start with a bunch of liquid things today and you say, if the model is right, what must the future be like to make this thing have the price that the model says? So for example, you say, um, here's the price of a bond. What must yields be like? What must interest rates be in the future to make this bond fairly priced? And then you calibrate the future. You don't predict the future. You calibrate it to something that you know. And then you say, OK, now if that's a fair price for the bond, then that's what the world expects interest rates to be. And now I can use those future interest rates to price something more complicated that I don't have a price for. So um, 
you're not really predicting the future, you're calibrating the future to the present and then using it to, to calculate the value of something else in the present. If you want to calculate the value of that thing in the future, so it's like what I did with the apartment. You say, if, if Battery Park City apartments are fairly priced, then the fair price per square foot must be $1,000 a square foot. Now let me figure out what something I don't know is based on that. Um, and then models are very powerful sales tools. Although they're based on mathematics, they used to tell you this option has a higher volatility than that one, this bond has a higher yield to maturity, this credit default swap has a, has a higher implied default rate than that one, and they let you rank order um, complicated things on a linear scale and give people who are dying for information or for, or for an opinion some kind of idea of what the model tells you is rich or cheap and what to buy or what to sell. And, um, and they're not really predicting the future, but they're telling you what the fair price is and hoping that in the future things will evolve towards their fair price. Not by dynamics, but by, not by detailed dynamics, but by market forces. Um, have I still got like 10 minutes? Okay. So um, I want to talk a little about laws of financial modeling. There's a very nice, let me go back. There's a very nice statement, um, which I don't agree with, but it's very funny, by Andy Lowe, who's a professor at, um, at, um, at MIT, um, who said in physics there are three laws that explain 99% of the phenomena and in finance and 99 laws that explain 3% of the phenomena. <laughs> and um, it's kind of a good line and I always laugh, but I actually, I've decided it's not really true. I think in finance, there's really only one law that works, um, and that is this one. If you want to know the value, I've more or less alluded to this, if you want to know the value of some target financial security whose price you don't know, use the known price of another replicating portfolio of securities that's as similar to it as possible. So in the case of the Park Avenue apartment, you replicate it out of simpler things like Battery Park City apartments. That was the target, the, the Battery Park City ones or the replicating ones. Um, this has a more precise, precise statement in finance. It's called the law of one price that says any two securities with identical future payoffs, and this is the key part really, no matter how the future turns out, should have identical current prices. So um, that's, that's the one law that doesn't always work, but, but the one law that people use most of the time. And you have to use that to build models. And the way people build most financial models is by using, that, by using the, 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 top, the top bullet point there. So first of all, you have to do two things. You have to, first of all, specify what you mean by saying no matter how the future turns out. You have to write down all the possible scenarios, the stochastic differential equation or the Monte Carlo scenarios that you mean by the future. And that's kind of the science part of all of the model building. Can you describe accurately what the, not what the future is going to be, but what the range of futures are going to be stochastically? Um, can you even do that? Um, and then once you've done that, um, you then have to show that under all of those scenarios, the thing you're interested in has the same payoff, meaning dollars or pounds, in every scenario in the future as the replicating thing that you put together. So would the rents on all the Battery Park City apartments collectively be the same under all circumstances as the rent on the, on the Park Avenue apartment in the future? And that's the construct of engineering part. Um, the trouble is, um, if you do this in mechanical engineering, you have Newton underlying the engineering, um, the science part. If you do it in electrical engineering, you have Maxwell underlying your electrical engineering and quantum mechanics. I'm not quite sure what you have underneath the financial engineering part. You do have Brownian motion and more advanced theories, but none of them really have anything like the accuracy, um, even to zero decimal places um, of, of, um, of, of the theories that you use in other kinds of engineering. So I think financial engineering is a, a good term, but, um, but, it, but it's, it's, um, you, can't, you, you can build electrical and mechanical devices that behave in predictable ways. You can't really build financial devices that behave in predictable ways. Um, it's a little bit, actually, I once, um, w w um, I once 30 or 5 or 40 years ago saw this movie called Bedazzled with, um, with Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, which I'm sure people in America don't know, but everybody knows here. And I saw it when I was taking my qualifying exams the night before in physics. And um, it's a story of Faust um, set in a Wimpy's in London where, where, um, where Dudley Moore, um, Dudley Moore is a short order cook who's in love with the waitress who doesn't have one, anything to do with him. And Peter Cook is the devil and asks him, and he agrees, Dudley, the short order cook agrees to sell his soul to the devil in exchange for seven chances to seduce the, the waitress. 
and he does it quite willingly and then he gets to pick his scenarios and he picks the first one. He says, I want to be um, her to be in love with me and both of us to be somewhere in a castle and wealthy and, and um, both of us to be in love with each other and the devil snaps his fingers and they're in a castle in Oxfordshire somewhere and they're in love with each other but they marry to different people and, and, and she has great scruples. And so it goes for all seven. The last one, he actually says, um, he, frustrating, he says he just wants to be... Um, he just wants to be in a quiet place where nobody will disturb them, and they both end up being nuns in a Trappist monastery. <laughs> so, um, and that's kind of the trouble with, with trying to write down the financial science, is that things always happen that you can't write down in one stochastic differential equation that will describe all the things that will happen, because there are people reacting. If somebody does come up with a correct theory, which people lately have um, physics-like models of um, of earthquake-like models which sound quite interesting about the way markets behave, but presumably if people start using them and people start introspecting, the planets don't really care what you say about them, but, but markets actually do. And if you start announcing that there's a forthcoming crisis, people's behavior will change. So very difficult. Um, yeah, I said Brownian motion is a theory for dust particles. It's really only a model for stock prices. So if I've got five minutes, I'm going to say a little bit about the right way to use valuation models. I think you have to use replication. Um, I don't want to get too technical, but there, there are various kinds of replication. The simplest is static, where you don't do anything at all. You replicate. It's like the apartments. You make a, a big apartment out of small apartments. There's dynamic replication, where you have to do something every day to rebalance your portfolio, to replicate something complicated. And that's what happens with Black and & Scholes, and that's much riskier and much more model dependent. Um, there's been a tendency for the last 20 years in my lifetime in, in finance to, to, make, um, to make finance more and more axiomatic. And there's something called the fundamental theorem of finance, um, which I'm not quite sure what it is actually, but, um, but um, it's roughly related to one of those, to the law that I set down. But there's been a tendency, I remember when I was in physics, somebody once wrote a textbook on trying to teach electrodynamics by writing down for those of you in physics, d mu f mu nu equals j nu, and just writing down Maxwell's equations and deriving all the consequences. And that's a great way to maybe teach a second or third course, but it seems to be a really lousy way to teach a first course where you want to talk about currents and, and things that people can actually have a visceral feel for. And unfortunately, finance has gotten a lot more axiomatic where people try to write down axioms and derive the theorems, but the truth is the world doesn't really satisfy any of them. So it's, it's, a, it's a very unfortunate way to, to teach um, without intuition. Um, there's also another difference. In physics, it really does somehow pay and work to drop down deep and write down the principle of least action or Hamilton's equations or Newton's laws or the Dirac equation. Um, use very fundamental variables that don't seem to be related to anything you can observe in the world at all and formulate a principle and then come back up again and discover that you can write down the Dirac equation here and, and discover a positron over there and who would have believed it? That doesn't really work very well in finance. I think deep it's tempting to be deep, and there's no harm in being deep, but shallow often works much better. And um, it's kind of, a lot of people in markets actually use fairly vulgar variables, vulgar meaning using parameters that aren't deep ones, but are ones that everybody uses every day that aren't quite accurate, but describe the market and find that the shortest path to get a good price is to go from here to there rather than to go down to something very deep and come up again. The deep stuff is interesting, but, it, but you're unlikely to write down the right equation for the way the world behaves. Um, so I said sweep dirt under the rug when you build a model, but make sure that people understand that you're sweeping dirt under the rug and what you're ignoring. Um, I'll actually like to think a lot of models as Gedanken experiments in physics where you're making a lot of imaginary experiments and imaginary worlds, and um, they're interesting as possible rational behaviors, but the real world isn't going to correspond for a long time to any one of them. And whenever you do one of these things, you have to remember to look over your shoulder because it's going to be violated sooner or later. Um, um, okay, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to jump through this, but Paul Wilmot and I once tried to ape the communist, revolu the communist manifesto about five years ago. Um, he's a British applied mathematician, finance guy. Um, because a lot of people blame financial, financial engineers for the, for the, for the, for the crash. And, um, a little bit unfairly, I think, and they backed off at the beginning. They said it's all models that caused the problem. Later on, when they got smarter, including Paul Volcker, who, who shamed his grandson, financial engineer, in public um, by saying um, he, he had an interesting article in which he's, his grandson said, I'm not responsible, I was just doing what I was told. And Paul Volcker said, I will not accept the, the Nuremberg excuse, <laughs> um, which I thought was a little extreme. Um, 
but never, so I, I honestly think the financial crisis came more from, from macro issues like keeping interest rates low whenever there was a crisis and stimulating the economy ceaselessly, um, plus a bunch of other things, too many, to, too, too many for anybody to eat, well, hard to even describe. But, but I wouldn't say financial models were, were, um, were blameless either, but I think they were more a tool for people trying to build securities that would give high yield in a low yield environment and using models to sell things, as I described before, than an actual cause of the situation. As Paul Krugman later pointed out, Spain had a big financial crisis too, and there were no models involved. There was just an immense, immense bubble in the mortgage market, and the Icelandic banks collapsed for no reasons other than over-leveraging themselves, nothing to, do with, nothing to do with anything mathematical. So um, I won't belabor this, but we were trying to say that if you build models, you, you have to remember that you're, um, that, you're, um, that you're using mathematics, but that the mathematics isn't going to work at some point, and um, you should remember that they may have great consequences that, um, that you can't even apprehend when you build them, and you want to give people a very accurate idea about their, about their limitations. So I'm going to finish up. I don't think the solution to our financial crises still ongoing is going to lie in mathematics. I'm not saying one shouldn't try to build better models, but the problem isn't really, there isn't some mathematical solution or equation or risk measure that's going to capture all the immensely complicated things that people can do once they know about it. Um, there's a line by William Blake that if a fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. And I think that's kind of a good way to use models in finance in that, um, you take, a model, um, you take a model like the Black-Scholes model, you know it's not quite right. Um, you'd be a little bit foolish in trying to push it as far as you can and seeing, like the liquid drop model, you push it as far as you can to see what you can get out of it that's useful, but you've always got to look over your shoulder and remember that at some point it's going to break down because it's only an analogy, it's not a fact. So be foolish, but, but be careful. Um, so a little hubris in using models in finance is kind of good. But um, catastrophes strike when your hubris goes one step too far into idolatry and you start to think that what you've written down is actually a really accurate description of markets and people and behavior. And you've always got to be somewhere between these two extremes, a little bit um, north of hubris, but be careful to stay south of idolatry. Um, I'm happy to end there. Thank you. Too large, uh, uh, are which too large? I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, you cautioned us on, on, on using uh, mathematical description and believing into it. But uh, do you have any assessment of, of the of factors which are outside the mathematics but which affect the real world? Y yeah, um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer. There are always, I mean, Smart people who use these models, like smart traders who use these models, like Black Scholes, for example, which really only has one parameter going into it, and that's you have to guess what the volatility in the future will be. And everything else is known in the model, interest rates, stock prices. Um, so there's obviously more things that affect option prices than that. And what smart people do is try to... Um, the model is kind of robust in the sense that if you think they're transaction costs, for example, which the model ignores, you can try to say, okay, my estimate of transaction costs is that you should raise the volatility by one point effectively or by two points. Or we're about to enter an illiquid period because people are scared, so you should have a bid ask spread that's three vault points instead of one vault point. So, yes, people, I mean, good models allow you to, to take account of um, things you can understand qualitatively and, and embed them in one parameter. Am I, am I answering you more or less? No. Okay. Um, about temperature, um, if you look, there are a lot of articles in behavioral finance, which is, which is a big craze for the last few years, sort of um, not really a discipline, but more a picking apart of all the, of all the assumptions that, 
Um, I would argue not really a discipline, but a picking apart of all the mistakes that people make by assuming that people behave rationally. But, but um, they do, they're going for a lot of data mining, and I actually like to look at it. You occasionally see articles that claim, yes, um, countries that um, lost in the World Cup, their stock markets do worse the next day, and, um, and um, people do worse in winter than in summer and temperature. I, I have no idea whether those things are true. They sound kind of implausible to me, but, but people look at those things. Models that are um, sort of complex nonlinear models, nonlinear systems like climate modeling or biological modeling? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and I should have said something about that. There are a bunch of people actually, um, um, I think they're still models, they're not theories, but there are a bunch of people who actually call themselves econophysicists, um, and then they joke that econo doesn't mean cheap. Um, um, <laughs> And one of them is, there's, there's a man called Eugene Stanley, who's a solid state physicist in Boston University. And there's another man called Doan, Doan Farmer, who's actually, I think, at Cambridge now, used to be at Santa Fe. And that's just a number of them. There are a lot. And they all build sort of more like statistical mechanics, solid state models, you know, with, um, maybe I'm, 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 I'm stretching a little too far, but with the possibility of phase transitions and collective behavior. Um, and those are very interesting. I think they're still models. They, they sort of, you know, they, they simplify the world, but they, they try numerically to look at the effect of collective effects and contagion like phase transitions. And th those are really interesting. And, and related more to like macro effects, you know, where, 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 um, where crises spill over from one market to another or across markets. And they, they, they're people looking at um, sort of network analyses um, of the links between all the people that borrow money, you know, all the institutions that borrow money in the world and how they will affect each other if one of them defaults and how it will propagate. Right. So Jessica, right over there. Oh. Oh, Jessica, come on. You have to shout or, get, or wait for the mic. I've often been struck about um, the lack of data in finance. And I sometimes think that if all the big data buried in the archives of different institutions could be unearthed, that we might learn a lot from it. Um, do you think that there is merit in that, that we might actually be able to go a little deeper with some validity if we, if we knew more? Yeah, I do. Um, um, she's asking whether there's merit in collecting data. I, I think there is. And the people I was just mentioning in econophysics, um, they look very carefully at lots of data on a very small time scale to do with um, the impact of trading on a market. Like if you, if you sell 100 shares, how much will the market move in response? And, and on a small time scale, they collect you know, terabytes of data for, for this and try to, try to build um, market impact models. I think it's good, I think it's good for that. I'm a little skeptical about things like Black Shoals or looking at models that, that whose testing requires um, you know, two or three or four years of data because the world just changes a lot over several years and, and financial, will, financial markets seem to go into different regimes where once upon a time you know, the price of gold was important for interest rates, then oil became important. So things, things, things change too fast to, get, to, to test the model. Pe people People actually test models very, very little in finance. It's sort of shocking, but people use them if they give them a good way of thinking, a good way of estimating more than testing them against data. And the, and the future implied data usually turns out not to be true in any case. Say it again? The implied data, the future data, uh, tends not to be true in actuality yes, in she, any uh, case. Yes, she's saying what, what most people do is, I said this a little bit, it's like, um, what, what, what people actually mostly do with models is look at a liquid price in the market of something complicated. Say, if the model is right, it has to fit it. And then they say, therefore, the model implies that in the future, volatility will be 20% per year. And so the model, if you believe all that matters is volatility, the price is telling you that in the future, volatility had better be 20% if that price is fair. And usually that doesn't turn out to be the case. So every day people recalibrate their model and everybody in finance longs for a model that's stationary and time invariant the way Newton's laws are, and they criticize everybody who doesn't have one, but actually nobody has one. It's a fair aspiration, but, but, but not possible yet, <laughs> ever. Um, thank you. Um, it all seems to be a bit one way at the moment. That is, uh, 
that concepts and techniques developed in physics are being taken into the financial world. Have you seen anything that could possibly go in the other direction? From the financial world to the, to the, to the scientific world? Where is the speaker? Sorry. Oh, okay. From the financial world to the... Yes. Um, well, that's sleep metaphor. <laughs> No, I mean, um, something we might actually use. You know? um, going from going from finance to, um, y you know, for, um, it's, it's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, for psychology, yes, because because financial markets are one of the few places where you can see honest answers to, to questions because people in the end put their money where their thoughts are, no matter what they say. And so I think there's a lot of interesting um, behavioral finance related to what people actually do as opposed to what they say they what they say they do. So I think it's a good field for, for, looking, at, um, looking, at, for, for, for looking at psychology and behavioral psychology. Um, what, there's been a tendency for people the other way to start saying physics is no good, let's look at biology as a, as a model for, for, for markets. Yeah. It's sort of a, <laughs> sorry? They don't say that here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think it's more wishful thinking. Nobody's really done that, done that convincingly, but you see people say they have, you know, sort of evolutionary models or, or, um, or biological. I, I quite like the a little hubris is good. I think sometimes, I, like, I quite like a little hu hubris is good. Sometimes we're a little bit too cautious, I think. Yeah, I, I, I believe it. If you, if you, otherwise, you would just throw up your hands at the beginning and do nothing. Um, what's your view of the difference between using data and doing experiments, which seems to me one of the crucial differences between modelers and ex physicists? Oh, between and big data and doing experiments? Big data doesn't do experiments. No, no, it doesn't. You're saying what's the difference? What's your view of the difference? Yes. Um, uh, I think you put your finger on I mean, big data, you, you can't control. In most cases, you can't control the experimental conditions. All you can do is is look at what happened, and, and um, it's a bit like doing cosmology in a way. Um, you know, you, you've only got one history to look through. Although, although I know people, maybe not so much for finance, but I know people who work on websites. Uh, most, most of it's advertising related, unfortunately. Um, but people who, who, who put up websites and change websites a little bit and immediately try to test, I mean, really in an experimental way, what effect that has on people clicking on it, and then experimentally see which, you know, which one works best. Um, so, but, but yeah, for the most part, um, it's looking at the past rather than trying to change conditions. Okay, last question from anyone? Beth, go on. It's a bit different, but I just wanted to ask, which did you find in your career more satisfying, doing physics or doing finance? <laughs> uh, Be careful, um, we know where you are. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You know, no, um, I, I was very sad when I left physics. I left physics for sort of, I don't want to call it force of circumstance, in that I, 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 I was a postdoc for seven years. I was a PhD student for seven years, which was really bad. Um, and, um, and I really, I, I, felt, I felt like I committed treason when I left physics. It was like awful. And, 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 and some people treated me like I committed treason too. Um, and so I was very sad to leave. Um, but I'm not sorry in retrospect, it was kind of a lonely life. In physics, you feel like if, um, if you're not Feynman, you're nobody a little bit. <laughs> and, and, um, and in finance, um, if you're not a genius, it's kind of a, it, in some sense, I don't know, maybe this is just the generation I grew up in where everybody sort of, uh, I sort of once joked in a book that I wrote, I said I started out like wanting to be Einstein, and then I wanted to be Bohr, and then I wanted to be um, T.D. Lee, and finally I was just jealous when the guy in the, office next door to me got invited to give a seminar somewhere where I didn't. Um, so my, my aspirations came down, came down slowly and fast, uh, slowly and painfully. Um, but, um, but, but maybe that was just me. But, but what was nice about finance and working on Wall Street for a long time was that it was a very nice mix of applied and, and, and pure. So you were actually building models, but at the same time you were in some sense, helping people. There were people who were interested in your results. You were doing computer programming. You were talking to clients. You were talking to traders. It was kind of, it was kind of a fairly rich, rich life from a social point of view. And um, it was a bit of a relief after sitting in an office and sort of 
struggling and getting depressed sometimes. And if you got a good idea early in the day, you would say, I'm going to go home because I don't want to find out whether it fails today. I'll leave it till tomorrow. <laughs> and on that note, I think we'll draw things to a temporary conclusion. Let's think they're running for a really stimulating and wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do join us downstairs for a refresh. Oh, thanks.